Welcome to our lecture online. Now let's take a closer look at Kepler's laws of motion, planetary motion. And let's take the easy one first, Kepler's second law, and it's understood to be what we call equal areas in equal time. What that meant was that he observed, based on the data that he collected in that notebook that came from Tacho Bracha, he understood that when planets are close to the Sun, they appear to be moving faster, and when they're far away from the Sun, they appear to be moving slower. Now, if you have an imaginary line from the Sun to the planet, and then you see this, the line moving as the planet moves, that line will then sweep out a certain area in a certain amount of time. So in a specific amount of time, it will sweep up the area A1. Now notice that it will be a bigger angle here because the planet is traveling faster. Then when the planet is far away, you can see that the angle is smaller, but then also the planet is farther away. And then the assumption was that the area swept up by this imaginary line between the planet and the Sun, well, that area happened to be the same regardless of where the planet was in its orbit. So equal areas were swept out in an equal amount of time. And so there, A1 must equal A2. So can we show why that would be the case mathematically? Well, let's try that. So again, here's the concept. We have the Sun, we have a planet going around the orbit, and notice in a certain amount of time, delta T, it'll cover a certain amount of distance along the line of motion, let's call it delta S, sweeping out the area delta A. The distance from the Sun to the planet then would be considered R. So how do we uh, express the concept of delta S? The amount of arc length traveled by the planet that would be equal to R times d theta, d theta, the amount of angle that swept up right here. So this would be d theta. So R d theta would be delta S. So then what we can say is, okay, what would be then the description of the area that swept out by that imaginary line? So we can say that the delta area is equal to the area that we see here, and it's approximately a triangle, so it would be one half the base times the height of the triangle. And of course the base, that's equal to delta S, and the height would be R. So this would be equal to one half the base, which is delta S, times the height, which is R. Now of course delta S was defined here as R delta D theta, or Maybe instead of d theta, I'll write delta theta. So that's probably better like that. So then we have this is equal to 1 half times delta S would be R delta theta times R, or that would be equal to 1 half R squared delta theta. And so that would be delta A. Now let's write that in differentials rather than in uh, deltas like this. So then we come up here and we'll rewrite it as follows. We can say that dA, a small amount of change in the area, is equal to one half the radius of the orbit squared times d theta. So now what we're going to do is we're going to divide both sides by a delta t or a d theta, a dt. So divide the left side by dt, divide the right side by dt, and so what we have here is that the amount of area swept out per unit time is therefore equal to one half times the radius squared, and of course d theta dt, that's simply the angular velocity omega. So this is how we can mathematically describe the area being swept out as a function of time. Then what we can also say is that the uh, angle of momentum is going to be equal to I times omega. I being the moment of inertia of the planet times omega. Now I, for a point object, which a planet would be a point object at a distance r away from the um, center of motion, which is the star or the sun, this would be equal to m r squared times omega. So I would be simply a point mass m, the mass of the planet, times the radius squared, and multiplied times the angle of velocity, which is the angular, which is the, mo uh, the, the uh, uh, <laughs> which is the angular momentum, L being the angular momentum. All right, now, notice that an object that's moving around, like a planet to move around the sun, the angular momentum must be constant. Because any object that's moving around in a circle or elliptical orbit doesn't matter, well, the angular momentum simply cannot change. So we know that by definition, this must be a constant. 
All right, so now let's take a look here. We have L being a constant, which means that this is a constant. So in other words, m r squared omega must equal a constant. Now notice that m is a constant, r is a variable because the radius will change, and omega, well, let's see here, is omega a constant? Well, you know that omega has to change because it's going to go fast. The planets will move faster here and slower there, so omega is a variable r is a variable, but the product of r squared omega, that must be a constant. Why do we know it's a constant? Because the angular momentum is a constant. And so now when we take a look at this, so we can say that dA dt is equal to one half r squared, oh, that's a terrible looking r, let me try this again, r squared times omega. So notice that this must be a constant, since you know m is a constant, and the product is a constant, which means that this must be a constant as well. And of course, one half is a constant, so that means that the dA dt, that must be a constant as well. So by simply comparing the equation we get for the change in area as a function of time, dA dt, being one half r, r squared omega, and then taking the angular momentum and showing that m r squared omega also must be a constant because an object going around the circle, unless there's something happening to it, you get an impact of a comet or something like that, the object, the angular momentum must be a constant, which means m r squared must, uh, r squared omega must be a constant, and therefore this must be a constant. And so simply by comparing the two, we conclude that yes, Kepler was correct indeed, the equal areas in equal time is a solid concept that is supported by the mathematical and physical conception uh, concept of how objects move around in circles or ellipses. And that is how it's done.